We appreciate you joining us today for our third installation of our 2024 education series. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Your lines are going to be muted today, but we do want your questions. So please grab your smartphone, open your camera app, and fire on the QR code that you see on your screen right now. That QR code is also going to be on the bottom of each of the presentation slides, so you don't have to worry about keeping track of it. That QR code is going to take you to an easy online form where you can ask all of your questions. I'll be monitoring those in the background, and we're going to try our very best to get to as many as possible today. Um, we are recording this presentation, and we're going to share a, a copy of the recording with you later, later on this week, as well as posting it to our Vimeo and YouTube pages. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague and Upstate New York Managing Director, Scott Lippa. Scott, thanks so much for being with us today. I'm gonna let you take it away. Thanks, Evan. Great to be here, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for taking time on what I feel is a very important subject and glad you are interested. I'm gonna divide this presentation into two parts. The first part is uh, the main part. We're gonna spend most of the time on just covering the basics of an HSA. And then in the last five to seven minutes or so, I'm going to talk about HSAs in relation to retirement and how they can be used as a savings tool, which is, in my view, pretty exciting. And things uh, in, in that part of the discussion, a lot of people are not aware of. So first, what is an HSA? It, it's part investment and it's part savings account. It's a tax advantaged account. Um, we like to call it triple tax advantaged. And uh, you can use it to pay eligible medical expenses. It is a self-directed account, and it's it's um, it's not like a flexible savings account, if you might be familiar with those, where you have to use that money by a certain time or you lose it. An HSA is an account that you can fund from year to year, and any money that you don't use in the account in that particular calendar year just stays in the account, rolls over to the next year, and can continue to build. So there's no issue with uh, you know having to spend it by a certain time. It can become retirement savings. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And if you do take the money out and don't use it for what we call a qualified medical expense, you will um, pay income tax on it. And depending on your age, you may owe a penalty. And the penalty is actually fairly stiff, 20% uh, if you're not at least 65. And you take it out for a non-qualified medical uh, expense. So how what's the eligibility like? You first have to have access to a high deductible health plan. And then come along with that is the option to open a health savings account. Um, and you there are certain rules. You can't have any other coverage other than what's allowed by law. And you aren't enrolled in Medicare, which means you're below age 65 and you're not claimed as a dependent on someone else's tax return for the year that you open the account. So we'll talk a little bit about that way at the end because there's a very special situation for younger folks who are still on their parents' medical plan but are no longer claimed as a dependent on their tax return. So just keep that in the back of your mind for a few minutes. All right, the health savings account is really two parts. It's a, it's, it's a health plan, but it's also the savings account, as I said earlier. And here are some of the main differences. A high deductible health plan generally has lower premiums than what we call a first dollar coverage health plan, or you might know this as a copay plan. And I'll just go back and forth here. What does that mean to you? That means you might save some money on your premiums, and some people will take that difference in what you might pay for a full-blown first dollar medical plan uh, and the high deductible uh, plan premium and put that into a health savings account. So you have some opportunity to save some money on health insurance premiums and maybe save that money toward a health savings account. You do have higher deductibles with a high deductible health plan and that's uh, thus the name. And that's usually because you're paying a lower premium, so the insurance company puts more of the onus on you to cover some of those earlier expenses. However, most preventive care is covered at 100%. Things like annual physicals, mammograms, um, certain other tests are, are usually covered at 100% in both circumstances, whether you have a high deductible plan or a non-high deductible plan. 
the high deductible plan has limits for what you can be charged, um, meaning you have protection from large expenses because there is something called an out-of-pocket maximum, which is under both types of plans, but they're much higher with a high deductible plan. Again, thus the name. Um, high deductible plans cover, uh, there's the uh, point I just made, things like, well, child visits, vaccinations, physicals, all at 100%. So this is an area where if you're considering a high deductible plan versus a different type of plan, you need to compare and contrast what's covered and what you may be responsible for, and you have to consider what your current health situation may be. So let's keep going here. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. A health savings account, when you make a contribution into your health savings account, that's a pre-tax deduction. That's a pre-tax contribution and you get a tax deduction for that. The earnings, if you do invest the money inside a health savings account, which some people are not aware you can do, um, the earnings grow tax deferred. And then if you use the money for any qualified medical expense, and there's a long list of those we'll share in a minute. You can always look those up on the IRS website. Doesn't matter how old you are, if you use it for a qualified medical expense, the money is tax-free, including the earnings that you made if you had invested the money. And then again, any unused balance rolls from year to year. So, you know, on the right here, what does this mean for you? You save on federal taxes, maybe state taxes as well. You don't pay taxes on the growth, similar to a 401k or 403b. You won't pay taxes on any distributions that are used or withdrawals that you make that are used for qualified medical expenses, and you have to have receipts to back those up. And you have the opportunity to grow this HSA into a, a, a pot of money that you can use in retirement, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. All right, if you're looking for what's covered by uh, money you can take out of your HSA, what you can spend it on, there is this IRS publication 502, and here's uh, some broad definitions that are in that uh, publication that describe the types of expenses that you can use your HSA monies for without paying taxes on the distributions. Um, I'm going to just cover a couple of these. They're, they're very general definitions here. Medical expenses are the cost of diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, and the cost for treatment uh, affecting any function of the parts or function of the body. That's a pretty broad definition. And if you want to know more specifics, you know, there's a little bit more data on this slide. I'm not going to read through the entire slide in the interest of time and getting to the Q&A. Um, but there's a long list of things we're going to cover here in a minute uh, on what's covered. Okay, qualified medical expenses can be across any of these categories, medical, dental, and vision. So there's some things on here you might not be aware of. Um, contact lenses are covered. You can use the money in your HSA to pay for contact lenses, eyeglasses, even some supplies you know, for, for that type of um, expense. Dental treatment, things that your other plan may not cover. You know, There's usually uh, maximums that are covered for things like major dental work. You can use your HSA to pay for the differences. Um, medical, you can pay your copays from your HSA account. You can pay for your prescription drugs. You can pay for any personal protective uh, equipment or any other devices um, that are covered as well. So there's a pretty wide range of things you can use your HSA uh, for. And in most cases, if you use the HSA to accumulate money for healthcare and retirement, you're gonna find plenty of ways to use that money and not have money left over. Here is a pretty thorough list. I'll just pause here for a second and, and pick up on a few of these that, you know, I didn't realize even getting into, uh, you know, HSA education as I have. Um, a wheelchair uh, is down here at the bottom right. Uh, psychiatric care, uh, infertility treatment. We all know that's that can be pretty expensive if anybody's been involved in that. HSA can be used for that. Um, crutches. Drug prescriptions I covered, eyeglasses, fluoride treatments. There's some, you know, certain things that are not covered at your dentist, typically with your dental plan. Guide dogs. There's an unusual one I didn't know about. Uh, physical therapy. So, you know, there's a long list here. And that publication 502 is constantly being updated 
That's an IRS publication, as I mentioned. So if you have any question about it, you can check that publication or you can always uh, check with a qualified tax professional. There are some limits as to what you can deposit into an HSA on an annual basis or for a given tax year. Um, as a single person, uh, meaning you're on a single person covered HSA plan, uh, it's 4,150 for the year 2024. These numbers get incremented every so often for inflation. If you're at on a family HSA eligible plan or high deductible plan, it's double that amount, 8,300. And then if you're 55 or older, you can make an additional what's called a catch-up contribution of $1,000. So those limits would go up by $1,000 each. That's a little bit different than the 401k or 403b catch-up age. That's age 50 for a for a retirement plan, for the HSA plan, it's 55. And you can make your HSA contribution for the tax year up until the tax filing, the normal tax filing deadline of the following year. So if you had not made uh, your HSA contribution for 2023 prior to April 15th of 2020, or I think it was April 17th this year, 2024, you had up until that time to make it for 2023. So that's always nice to get a little extra time. All right, here's something to be aware of if you do take money out of your HSA that is not used for qualified medical expenses. If you are younger than age 65, there is a 20% penalty that you will pay, um, similar to a penalty that you can pay in your retirement plan for an early withdrawal. If it's after age 65, it's just considered ordinary income and you get taxed at whatever rate you're taxed at at the time you make the withdrawal. So remember, the money going into this account is pre-tax contributions. If you take it out later and don't use it for qualified medical expenses, you will owe uh, income tax. And depending on if you're uh, younger than 65, you may owe a 20% penalty. So keep that in mind. All right, you own your HSA account. You, um, if you have an HSA account today that may not be an investment HSA account, you can roll this money over into an investment HSA or another type of HSA account if you so choose at any time. Um, you, if you, if you die with an HSA balance in your account, your beneficiary inherits that amount and it becomes taxable to them. And you can um, take your HSA account with you if you go from one employer to another and you still have a high deductible plan, or even if you don't, that HSA plan is yours to use for medical expense, qualified medical expenses whenever you choose, whether you're still on an HSA plan or not. Okay, here's a quick comparison between flexible spending accounts, which many of us are familiar with, and health savings accounts. And uh, I'll just run, I'll run down these real quick. Again, to be eligible for a health savings account, you have to be part of a high deductible health plan. To, and that's to make contributions to the account. Once it's established and you have money in the account, you don't necessarily need to still be in a high deductible plan to use the money. With a flexible spending uh, account, that can be attached to any health plan that's provided by your employer, the HSA account, is something that you initiate. Your employer may make a certain HSA um, program available to you as part of your high deductible plan, but you're actually free to open up the HSA account wherever you choose. That could be at your credit union, your bank, an investment company, and there's there's several HSA uh, companies that focus on HSA accounts out there. Um, contribution limits. They both have contribution limits. I just talked about the one for the HSA, and there is a different lower limit for the flexible spending account. Um, you can adjust your contribution with an HSA anytime. You can set up automatic contributions from your paycheck into your HSA. You can make lump sum contributions right from your bank account if you want. But with an FSA, usually that's only done um, set up during annual enrollment, and usually it has to be done through payroll deduction. And does your balance carry over? Yes, for the HSA. We talked about that. If you don't use the money in any given calendar year and, and with an FSA, 
there is a time limit by which you have to use up the money. Usually you get into about April of the following year before you have to totally use it up or lose the money. Are they investable? Yes, with the HSA, no with the FSA. Do you have tax-free earnings? Yes, with the FSA, or sorry, yes with the HSA, no with the FSA. And is this a long-term, can this be used as a long-term savings vehicle? Yes, we've covered that on the HSA, but no, not on the FSA, because that basically resets to zero every year. Um, the FSA contribution, by the way, that is that does lower your taxable income. So there is there is that benefit as well to the flexible spending account. All right, we talked about this already. You can use your HSA anytime you see fit for a qualified medical expense. Again, if you take money out of it before you're 65 or not to be used for a qualified medical expense, um, you could have additional taxes and penalties. And it is portable, like I said. You change employers, change plans, that account can go with you. You do not have to open up a new HSA account if you, for example, move from one employer to another and are now part of a different high deductible health plan. You can still use your former HSA account to continue to fund while you are under that high deductible health plan. Um, again, no use it or lose it policy. We covered that already. A lot of HSA accounts will give you a debit card that you can use um, right at the point of sale in your doctor's office for any, any qualified medical expense. You can also, this, import, this point on the right here is very important and what I'm gonna talk about in the back part of the presentation. You do not have to take money out of your HSA account if you are saving in, in one to pay for a qualified medical expense right now. You could do it at any point in the future if you save your receipt. So to use your HSA for a wealth accumulation tool, you can pay your medical expenses out of pocket, save your receipts, let your money in your HSA continue to compound and grow, and then later you can use those receipts to withdraw money out of your HSA account. There's no time limit, there's no expiration, even if you are no longer covered by a high deductible plan at that point. So I'll let that sink in for a second because that's a point that most people don't know and that's gonna lead me now right into our discussion around retirement. So this is, if you are, if you are able to, and again, you have to have the cash flow to be able to pay for your medical expenses or a majority of them while you let your HSA contributions accumulate and grow. But if you're able to pay for those out of cash flow, save your receipts, and then continue to make contributions into your HSA, you can maximize the growth of that HSA through investments. And then sometime later, um, potentially in retirement, use that money to pay for health care, whether it's ongoing health care at the time or previous expenses that you incurred that you saved your receipts for that were also not previously reimbursed. The one thing that most people underestimate in retirement is the cost of health care. And think about it for a second. That money's got to come from somewhere. If you stopped working and now your retirement assets are your income, are turning into your income, if you've saved in your 401k or your 403b and you've saved pre-tax money in there and you need to take that out for a healthcare expense, you're gonna pay taxes on every dollar of that money that you withdraw. If you put the money into your retirement plan as a Roth contribution or after tax, you didn't get the tax deduction up front, but the withdrawal is tax-free if you meet certain criteria. With an HSA plan, you get the best, the best of both worlds. You get a pre-tax deduction contribution into your HSA, and if you use the money for a qualified medical expense later, it's tax-free. So it's the best of both worlds, and part of what we talk about with individuals is how to maximize both. Here's a fact on healthcare. This survey is done every year. The average couple aged 65 right now will spend about $300,000 over their remaining lifetime on healthcare expenses out of pocket over and above what Medicare covers. That's a big number and that money's got to come from somewhere as an, as a, and as I just explained, if you take it out of your retirement plan, 
there's pros and cons depending on what type of balance you have in your retirement plan. The HSA is most certainly a better option if you can try to accumulate um, a, a larger balance in your HSA over time. So here are some of the similarities between an HSA and a retirement plan. Your contributions to a health savings account are tax-free. Your 401k or 403b, depending on which way you put it in, um, may or may not be subject to taxes. The earnings are tax-free, meaning they're deferred until you take them out. And if, you're, if your contributions to your retirement plan were pre-tax, you're going to pay taxes later on those earnings. Um, withdrawals for qualified medical expenses, as we've said a few times now, in your HSA or from your HSA are tax-free. And depending on which way you put the money into your 401k or 403b or other retirement plan, you may pay uh, income taxes. And then down at the bottom, required minimum distributions. There's no required minimum distribution. If you know what this is, when you reach a certain age, the government says, we need you to take your money out of your retirement plan so we can collect those taxes. Um, there's no requirement on an HSA to have a required minimum distribution at any age. Just like there's no required minimum distribution for a Roth or after-tax IRA um, or a Roth 401k now. They changed that rule just recently. So this chart takes a minute to sort of digest, but basically what this is telling us is that if you have an HSA, and a retirement plan. By using your HSA to pay for healthcare expenses in retirement, it helps extend the duration of the money in your retirement account that you're gonna use for income by about an average of six or seven years here, or two thirds longer than if you had to use the same amount out of your retirement plan for healthcare expenses. So this is, a great way to accumulate more money for retirement, get an upfront tax deduction. And then if you end up saving too much money in your HSA plan, it just counts as ordinary income later if you take it as income. So you almost can't lose. All right, I already talked about this. Um, there's a triple tax advantage. As we know, you get a tax deduction, it grows tax deferred, and it's tax free if you take it out and use it for a qualified medical expense. And um, in some ways, depending on how your 401k or 403b is set up, and depending on how uh, whether your employer puts in a, a contribution for you, the HSA can be the better choice for your first dollars of retirement savings if you're going to use the account that way. Um, if you're going to use your HSA as a way to fund your ongoing everyday health care expenses and not let the balance accumulate and grow, that's a perfectly fine way to use an HSA. And the biggest benefit there is you get a tax deduction for the contribution, as well as you don't have to worry about spending the money from one year to the next um, or losing it like you would in a flexible spending account or an FSA. Okay, when you're in retirement, as I said earlier, the biggest expense people underestimate in retirement is health care. Um, you will have out of pocket expenses in health care, including things like your Medicare premiums, for example, which an HSA can use to be pay to pay for most Medicare premiums, not all, but most. Um, and that last bullet, very important. document, document, document. I tell everybody, if you're going to use your HSA for a wealth building tool, save your receipts, stick them in a shoebox, throw them in the cloud, whatever you got to do to keep track of those. And if you accumulate a pretty good sum of uh, qualified medical expense tax receipts, by the time you hit retirement, you literally can go into your HSA and take those out as one lump sum, as long as you have the receipts to back it up. You could space them out, kind of treat it as income in retirement. Um, divide by a number of years, take those out every year, take those receipts, set them aside until you use up all those receipts. Also, while you're potentially paying for ongoing medical expenses in retirement with your HSA money. All right, this is the fun part. What can my HSA balance grow to? On the left, if you are under a self-only high deductible plan, 
and these are various ages along the bottom. If you are putting money into an investment HSA that is earning about a 7.5% compound annual growth rate, and you start at age 25, or 30, 35, 40, you can see the chart. The blue bar is if you fund the HSA at the maximum level for five years. So if you do this starting at age 25, between 25 and 30, you put in the 4,300, I'm uh, sorry, 4,150, 4, 4,150, and don't put another dime in it. And it compounds at an average of seven and a half percent, you'll have over 300,000 in that account by the time you get age 65. And so on down the line, if you're a family plan, I'm sorry, if you do that for 10 years, the next bar under 25 right here, your account will be around 550,000. That's a pretty big number that can be used to go a long ways toward healthcare and retirement. And as we know, people are living longer, healthcare is getting more expensive. You know, these numbers, that 300,000 or so that an average uh, couple needs uh, are likely to, it's likely to continue going up year after year. Over on the right, if you're under a family high deductible plan, and again, you fund an account for only five years or 10 years, blue and orange lines, starting at different ages, you can see what these numbers are and they can be pretty attractive. Um, and again, if you end up with too much money in your HSA uh, account and you end up having to use it in retirement for income, it's just like your pre-tax contributions to your, to your retirement plan you're gonna just pay ordinary income tax on it. Again, beyond age 65. If you're, if you're younger than 65, you'll owe a penalty uh, of 20%. Now here's one, this next slide is a very special situation. Not many people know about this. If you are a younger person on your parents' high deductible plan, and it's a family high deductible plan, and you are no longer on their tax return claimed as a dependent. Even if your parents have established an HSA at the family level, you can fund another HSA of your own at the same family level, not the single level. So instead of that 4150 maximum that you would have, you can put in 8,300 for as many years as you are off their tax return and on their high deductible family level plan. Typically, this happens at age 24 for most young people. They spend ages 24 and 25 off of your parents' tax return and maybe on their parents' health care plan. And if it's a high deductible plan for those two years, they can fund an HSA at, at $8,300 a year. And if they were to do that at ages 24 and 25, they would have a, and fund it with nothing else after that. At the same 7.5% compound growth rate, their account would be worth about 310000 at age 65. If they chose to fund their HSA for another five years at the single level on top of those two years at the family level, they would about double that. So this is pretty powerful. Uh, depending on your situation, we usually recommend taking a look at both your retirement plan options and your health plan options. This is a very personal decision as to whether to go on a high deductible health plan and utilize an HSA versus stay on a, a copay or a first dollar covered plan. Um, and that takes a little bit of analysis to understand the differences and the potential. So with that, I'm going to uh, end our presentation. Here's some disclosure, and we'll uh, start our Q&A here in a second. Evan? All right, awesome. Scott, I'm gonna let you stop and catch your breath for a minute because that was a lot. Thank you so much for all yeah. of that information. We did have a few questions come in. Um, I'm gonna start off with an easy one for you, Scott. Can I put funds outside of my paycheck into my HSA account? Yes, you can. So you don't have to have all your contributions to your HSA come through payroll deduction. You don't even have to have any of them come through payroll deduction. You can literally connect your HSA account to your checking account or savings account, and you can just transfer money at will. Now, you have a maximum, and that maximum does include anything that your employer may put in the account for you. 
So some plans, because they uh, incentivize you to go on the high deductible plan because it's cheaper all around for everyone, they may use some of that savings to make a deposit into your HSA account. That counts toward your maximum, whatever it is, the single or the family. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Scott, maybe you can speak to this one. Can I use my HSA dollars outside of the U.S. for medical expenses? I believe the answer to that is yes. I, as long as you are the recipient of that medical care and that, that high deductible plan is part of your health plan, then yes, you can use that money anywhere for any covered expense, any qualified medical expense. And just to tag on to that, if your HSA provider has given you a Visa or MasterCard logo debit card, yeah. you can swipe that anywhere Visa or MasterCard is accepted for your qualified medical expenses while you're out of the country. So if you get sick while you're out of the country. Yeah, great point. That, that may be an incentive for you to get one if you may not have one for your HSA account. And a lot of those providers do provide that today. And maybe that's something if you're shopping for an HSA account provider, check into that to see if that's an option. Awesome. Here's a biggie, Scott. Is there risk of legislators taking away our ability to reimburse ourselves later with our saved receipts? You know, that's, um, I'm smiling because these things always get floated in Congress. Um, I'm in the retirement plan industry, so we're always seeing a Congress try to find more creative ways to limit our ability to take advantage of some of the things that they have provided for us. Roth IRAs is a big one. Um, I would say there's never no possibility that that can happen. The chances of that happening, though, I would put at pretty low because this is, um, you know, HSAs haven't been around that long. They're extremely powerful. There is a huge lobby in Congress that is, um, you know, in favor of a lot of things like HSAs and Roth IRA accounts and other things having to do with the retirement industry, that would be pretty tough to reverse or change course on. So there's never no possibility. And, you know, in most cases, I would bet if they did, if they did manage to make a law change, there would be some set of grandfather rules to allow people that have already created an HSA account, accumulated expenses to be able to use their account to pay those expenses. Great, great. Um, Scott, is the employer contribution, if my HSA is through my employer, is the employer contribution in addition to the annual limit? I wish it was, but the answer to that is no. You have a, you have a limit to what you can put in on a calendar basis, no matter what the source is whether it's you or your employer. That's the 4150 and 8300 at the family level. Perfect. Uh, here's another one, Scott. Can I pay for my family's medical expenses with my HSA if they're not covered by my high deductible, high deductible medical plan? Great question, and yes, you can. Fantastic. And I am going to give you just one more here, Scott, before we close out. Um, can I have more than one HSA? You can. Um, most people don't, or maybe you wound up with a second or multiple HSA accounts because you didn't realize that you can consolidate those, just like you can consolidate IRA accounts or other retirement accounts. Um, you do not have to carry multiple HSA accounts, and especially, you know, this happens, I, I see a lot of times when people change employers, now you're under a different high deductible plan, and you feel like you have to open up a new account. You can keep multiple accounts if you so choose, um, but you certainly have the option to consolidate them under the best option that you see fit for yourself and your situation. Great. Well, Scott, uh, one, yeah, one note there, you know, if you are using perhaps your HSA for a combination of ongoing medical expenses and investment purposes to accumulate money for retirement. Most of the HSA account providers will require you to keep a certain amount of money in cash that you cannot invest. Sometimes it's $1,000, sometimes it's $2,000. 
um, you need to kind of right size that for your own situation to understand what your ongoing expenses might look like. Um, because any money that you do invest in your HSA, um, you know, does carry some risk like investments do in your 401k or 403b. We usually recommend a, a bit less aggressive type of investment strategy in an HSA account. Um, and, and you can do that and still get a seven and a half percent or so estimated, you know, compound annual growth rate uh, without taking a lot of undue risk. So that's just something to keep in mind that you can use the account for both purposes. I, I didn't want to imply earlier that it's got to be an either or because everybody's situation is different. And, you know, the point is to make maximum use of your resources when it comes to saving for retirement and taking care of your health care at the same time. Excellent. And Scott, we just got one more buzzer beater question. So let Great. me give you this one before we close out. What happens to my HSA balance if I'm no longer covered by a high deductible medical plan? Great question. That account is yours forever. You may continue to use it for qualified medical expenses. You just cannot make any more contributions to it unless you um, are still under uh, an HSA plan. Um, so you can only make contributions during the years you were covered by a high deductible health plan but you can always use the money, even if you come off a high deductible plan for any qualified medical expense, no matter what your age. And then again, just as a reminder, if you take the money out of it and don't use it for a qualified medical expense, it's treated as ordinary income. And if you're under the age of 65, there's also a 20% penalty. So be aware of that, that's, that's a little steep. Um, so if you can avoid that, great. Thank you so much for that reminder, Scott. All right, guys, it looks like we've covered all of our questions today. Thank you for being with us. I hope to see you again at one of our future education events. Mark your calendars. Our next live education event is on November 12th. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, everyone. Take care.